name is Hannah Cooper, and I, along with Joseph Frankel, are the co-chairs of the Collaborative Archaeological Work Group, which is presenting today's roundtable alongside the University of Michigan Museum of Anthropological Archaeology. The Collaborative Archaeological Work Group, or CAW, is a Rackham interdisciplinary workshop that fosters collaboration among archaeologists working in different disciplines. This year, CAW's programming is focused on exploring the role that archaeology plays in the contemporary world, especially in its colonial and imperial legacies. These legacies extend to the academic institutions of which we are a part. Before moving into today's exciting discussion, we'd like to recognize the emplacement of the University of Michigan on indigenous lands that have allowed for this gathering to occur. The University of Michigan is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations made the largest single gift to the early university when they ceded land through the treaty at the foot of the rapids so that their children could be educated. Through these words of acknowledgement, their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and their contributions to the university are renewed and reaffirmed. Creating and sustaining mutually beneficial partnerships with indigenous peoples, communities, and nations is one element of community-based archaeology, an umbrella term to describe a set of practices where archaeologists work alongside community members to produce and preserve archaeological knowledge. In the past two decades, archaeologists working across the globe have increasingly recognized the importance of such a framework to pursue a more equitable and just discipline. Today's roundtable hopes to foster discussion among four academic archaeologists who work in different geographic and cultural contexts but who all employ some aspect of community engaged practices in their work. The roundtable will proceed in three parts. First, we will hear short presentations from each of our participants, introducing their research and uh, projects. Next, we'll have a discussion with our facilitator and participants. And to conclude, there will be a brief Q&A. Um, throughout the session, attendees may ask questions in the Q&A box. Um, we also have transcripts turned on um, and the session will be recorded. So now I will introduce um, our first presenter. Um, Krista Rizuski is an associate professor of anthropology at Wayne State University. She's a historical and contemporary archeologist and has conducted community-based archeology span projects in New England, the Caribbean, and the Midwest. Here is Dr. Krista Rizuski. Thank you, Joey. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I know this uh, this session has been a long time in the making, goes back to pre-COVID times, and I'm really excited to be here today and speak with the other panelists as well. Um, this is a topic that's near and dear to me. Um, I've incorporated community-based archaeology in some capacity in all of my work, uh, and maybe that's because of my particular uh, expertise in historical archaeology, where community archaeology is now inseparable from many aspects of um, historical archaeological practice. In the <clears throat> past year, um, I finished two books that you can see the lovely covers of here, um, whose writing style is really oriented to a broad readership, the kind of educated public and undergraduate students. Uh, once based on the archaeological project I've been co-directing on Montserrat, where I've worked since 2006. Um, and we've partnered with the Montserrat National Trust and did many outreach and collaborations with them over time. Um, the book itself is kind of a comprehensive archaeological history. And the other that's due to come out next year um, is called Detroit Remains. And it showcases um, six very different community-based collaborative projects that I've undertaken in the past decade since I've been in Detroit. And it's really meant to show the nitty gritty uh, process and outcomes of community archaeology, something I thought was really lacking in the literature. Um, and just to kind of hone in on this for a second, um, these are the six case studies. And some of you might know Elspeth Geiger, there she is in the top left. Uh, we and, and they began in some of them began in 2012 and they went as recently as last year. Uh, they involve a wide variety of different stakeholders, um, neighborhood residents in all cases, but then the range goes from business owners to historic preservationists to 
famous musicians and even descendants of the Purple Gang Prohibition era mobsters. And all of these people um, have different notions of what archeology span might contribute to these sites and to their histories. And they also have different notions of uh, and motivations for engaging with collaborations with archeologists. Um, all of these projects were community guided. They're not projects that I created and then later on held an open day or invited public participation. They're projects that were inspired by conversations with local landowners or other entities. The properties are a mix of public and privately owned. So those distinctions come with their own sets of, of complicated relationships. Um, and all of the projects uh, involved my students at Wayne State, excuse me, my students at Wayne State. Some involved excavation, some involved building survey, some involved pedestrian survey and documentation. So a real mix of methods. Um, and so I will reference some of these today. The initials that you see here refer to the stakeholder groups who we worked with on the project. So PD is Preservation Detroit. Um, DSC is the Detroit Sound Conservancy. FOG, Friends of the Grandy Ballroom. So those are two really important grassroots preservation efforts in Detroit. But then we have um, kind of corporate America in the mix too with Bedrock Real Estate. HGTV, we have government entities like the State Historic Preservation Office, um, Historic uh, Hamtramck City Council, there are museums, City of Detroit artists, and so on. So a really, really broad range of um, communities involved. You know, in other words, the notion of community here is not monolithic. Uh, right now, this semester, I'm finishing up work at um, the old Hamtramck Center site where uh, this was our second season of excavations and they're undertaken in collaboration with the Hamtramck Historical Museum, uh, which is a really awesome grassroots institution in Hamtramck. And they're done as part of my archeological field methods class. So we had a, a well, that's my cat, a, a COVID safe uh, <laughs> excavation this semester. Some of you visited. I'll, I'll point out the YouTube uh, channel here, which um, we can link to and people can watch a video on it later. But I wanted to very quickly recognize this site because it, um, working in Hamtramck presents a whole new slate of unique challenges um, compared to the Detroit remains case studies. Uh, the population in Detroit for the, uh, sorry, in Hamtramck for the past hundred years since it's been a city has been 40% foreign born pretty much the whole time. Today it's a Muslim majority city. Um, it's always been a working class city. So there are some really distinct challenges uh, when it comes to connecting the history of the first generation of the city that we're excavating at the old Hamtramck Center site with the now um, immigrant and Muslim majority city today. So that's something that um, I might bring into the conversation as well. Okay, um, I think I'll stop there. Um, all of these projects are really slow. Um, data gathering processes that have very, very long aftermaths. Thanks. Uh, excellent. Um, so our next presenter will be Ana Antonio. She's recently defended graduate student in the Department of Anthropology and the University of Michigan Museum of Anthropological Archaeology. Dr. Antonio has con uh, conducted research in the Pacific Northwest and in Cyprus. Um, her dissertation examined the prehistoric cultivation of marine resources on the coast of Washington in collaboration with the Shoalwalter Bay Indian Tribe and the Chinook Indian Tribe, Na in Chinook Indian Nation. Uh, Thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Joseph and Hannah, for inviting me. Very excited to be here. Um, as Joseph, Joseph said, my name is Anna Antonio and I recently defended my dissertation. Uh, in my dissertation, I argue that an archeological understanding of past subsistence practices stemming from research that's conducted in collaboration with descendant communities can help these communities uh, revitalize traditional foodways, establish food sovereignty, uh, work towards reclaiming rights to local food sources and ultimately uh, improve their dietary health. I illustrate this with work conducted with the Shoalwater Bay Indian Tribe and the Chinook Indian Nation. 
Uh, together, we conducted archaeological investigations of an ancestral village site uh, and used the scientific data stemming from those investigations to argue that local natural resources, particularly marine resources, were indispensable to their lives prior to European colonization and that access to these resources today is an inherent right of Indigenous people and crucial to their health and well-being. So just to give a little background, um, if I can get my slides to change. Yeah. So in the US, Indigenous communities often suffer poor health at far greater rates than non-Native populations. This is largely a consequence of past and present ethnic inequality in America and its ongoing effects. Uh, things like economic stress, restricted access to food sources, and the colonization of Native American territories, a process that physically severed ties between Indigenous people and their land, weakening or destroying their culturally informed subsistence practices. To remedy these health disparities, many indigenous communities, uh, including the Shoalwater and the Chinook, are revitalizing traditional foodways and working to reclaim their local, um, their rights to local, healthy, and culturally relevant food sources. I believe that archaeology can help in these efforts when conducted as community-based participatory research and when using the host-guest model of interaction. These are kind of the two uh, ways I frame my work. Uh, Community-based participatory research endeavors to create socially conscious scholarship that builds capacity within communities by enlisting community members in the process of gaining and creating knowledge that attends to their own needs and interests. And the host guest model of interaction explicitly acknowledges Indigenous communities' rights to control archaeological research conducted on their heritage and considers archaeologists guests who obtain consent uh, to undertake this research with and for the community. And I see this as a necessary shift away from the positioning of archaeologists as saviors, agents of change, or sources of empowerment for Indigenous communities. So to use archaeology in this way, I first needed to build a collaborative relationship. Uh, I started working with the Shoalwater and the Chinook in 2014. And over the years, we've built a really solid partnership, um, in part by following these kind of three guiding principles. So we prioritize uh, long-term relationships between researchers and communities, uh, particularly that extend beyond purely research-based encounters. We feel this produces a more equitable relationship and helps us to make connections between research and everyday life. Uh, we strive for compassionate communication and a willingness to be humble from all partners. And we recognize the value of each partner's skills and knowledges while giving primacy to the rights and ownership of descendant communities. Uh, this has allowed us to clearly place community benefit as a central priority to, in our relationship, uh, reinforce the power of ind Indigenous communities, and produce mutual respect between partners. So I, I built my relationship with the Shoalwater and the Chinook through a series of short-term, uh, short small-scale projects. There we go, I wasn't worth playing. Um, and in 2017, the Shoalwater asked me to return to conduct archaeological investigations of New Connells, an ancestral Chinookan and Lower Chehalis village site, and to gather evidence pertaining to past subsistence practices to help them revitalize traditional foodways. And the picture that we get from New Connells is of a life that was deeply connected to the local marine environment, uh, perhaps not surprisingly. By all measures, marine resources um, are really dominant in the faunal assemblage, and we identified some key resources, uh, things like cockle, whale, uh, various clams, salmon, flounder, and sturgeon. So this project culminates in a series of community-defined public goods that use the archaeological record to translate and adapt past subsistence practices into modern, culturally relevant, healthy food practices. Uh, we launched a exhibit for the Shoalwaters Heritage Museum. Uh, this establishes New Connell's Village as a site containing a really important information and um, goes through the ways in which the environment, the local environment was really crucial to past and present foodways. Uh, we also produced an education kit for K through 12 classrooms to bring this revitalization project um, into uh, classrooms in Washington state. And we've also used the archeological data uh, to form the basis of a module relating to native foodways in the Shoalwaters 
uh, diet and nutrition course that's in their wellness center um, to kind of translate into modern healthy food practices. So through this work, ultimately, and moving forward, our goal is to use the archaeology to help the community feel more connected to their culture and be healthier because of it. Um, and that's a very quick kind of synopsis of, of my project and, and a way to frame what I'll be talking about today. Great. Great. Thanks, Anna. Um, our next presenter is Jeff Emberlin. Uh, Jeff is currently a research scientist with the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology and is a lecturer in the Department of Middle East Studies at the University of Michigan. He's conducted fieldwork in Syria and currently in Sudan, um, where his research focuses on state formation and imperialism. Uh, take it away, Jeff. All right. Thanks a lot, Joey. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, everyone, for uh, being here. I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, so I'm here today as an archaeologist who started a really traditional research project in northern Sudan in 2013 uh, and has found that it's developed into a highly collaborative uh, field project. Um, we're working with Sudanese professional colleagues as well as members of the local community here at El Kuru uh, to engage with local culture and heritage as well as with the more narrowly defined archaeological research questions that, uh, that we began with. The site itself and the village itself is called El Kuru. Uh, the site is a royal cemetery for kings and queens of ancient Kush in the early first millennium BCE, including kings who conquered Egypt and ruled there as its 25th dynasty. Our project excavated a later Kushite pyramid, that's the big thing in the middle of the slide here, uh, and funerary temple, as well as a portion of a much later medieval Christian town. I personally had previously directed a project in northeastern Syria and had some uh, vague ideas then about getting local people excited about the ancient past. And in Syria, I failed completely. Um, so it's a bit of a, been a bit of surprise to me and a very welcome one uh, that our project in Sudan has developed in this more collaborative direction. Um, how and why did that happen? Uh, I, have, I have some uh, some answers that may be helpful to some of you who are not starting with this as your, um, your background. Um, I'd first give credit to my Sudanese friends. Uh, the local community was, was somewhat wary of us at first, but we quickly developed uh, mutual trust. Um, that happened because of the help we had from our Sudanese archaeologist colleagues in negotiating local relationships. And even more importantly, from the active support and friendship of an influential local man named Mansour Muhammad Ahmed. In 2015, we had a meeting for the village to talk about the excavation. And again, uh, this was just a kind of a traditional thing where we were going to talk about uh, what we were doing. As it happened, only men from the village showed up, which remains a challenge um, in this Muslim environment for our community engagement work. I had been very careful from the beginning not to try to impose any idea of heritage. Uh, for example, the idea that the, the ancient pyramids were their heritage. Um, and in fact, there were a number of reasons why people locally might not have felt a close connection to the site. The local ethnic group is called the Shaigia. Uh, they're Muslim and they trace their ancestry to the Arabian Peninsula. They did not feel a strong connection to the ancient inhabitants of Sudan, to say nothing of medieval Christians. Uh, in fact, that connection to ancient Sudan is today claimed by a different group, Nubian speakers who now live further to the north in, in Egypt and uh, I'm in northern Sudan and southern Egypt. Our conversations in the public meeting, though, showed that they, uh, local people did have their own heritage narratives about the ancient past. They just weren't the ones that uh, we might have expected. Uh, the one that surprised me the most was when they asked if I thought ancient Kushites were darker skinned or lighter skinned than the Shaigia. Uh, but there were also many other surprises. Um, and I, I didn't have an answer to their question. And in fact, it wasn't a part of my own research design. Um, but this is an example of the benefit of not closing off conversation by imposing a vision of what we expect local heritage should look like. Another reason we moved to our community engagement was encouragement from members of the African Studies Center here at the University of Michigan, uh, particularly committee members uh, of the African Heritage Initiative, 
whose broad and critically informed perspectives on heritage opened my eyes to possibilities for working with local communities. Two committee members, uh, Ray Silverman uh, of, of University of Michigan and Koja Gabua of the University of Ghana, visited Okuru in 2016, and their very open-ended questions and conversations with community members reinforced the lesson, uh, don't impose your own vision of heritage. Finally, we, we, along with about 40 other projects in Sudan, had generous multi-year funding from the Qatar Museums Authority that included uh, provision for building a visitor center, but no uh, guidance or directive about how to, how to go about uh, doing that. Together with our broader conversations in the, in the community around their own ideas of, of heritage, this led us to uh, plan to build a community heritage center uh, that would include an opportunity for visitors uh, to the site to also learn something about local culture uh, and particularly to eat local food specialties. Um, and this heritage center would also, as, as the community uh, requested, provide space for various community activities. Uh, one of our instructions from, uh, from the organizers was to try to define our terms a little bit. So I thought a little bit about whether I, I think that what we're doing fits into the term community archaeology. And I think that that term doesn't really fully capture what we're doing, what we've ended up doing um, in this project. We're definitely working with the community, but our work is not solely about archaeology. And I, I suspect that the other presenters would agree with me on this, on this point. Um, uh, to frame the collaboration that way would be to limit the benefits of the activity to archaeology, which is to say to us uh, scholars rather than to the local community. I look forward to further discussion um, and I'll turn it back over to Joey. Great, thanks Jeff. Um, our final presenter is Lisa Young. Um, she is a lecturer in anthropology at the University of Michigan and a research affiliate with the University of Michigan Museum of Anthropological Archaeology. Her fieldwork is conducted in Arizona, where she focuses on small scale farming communities and works closely with the Hopi and Homolovi State Park. Um, thank you, Lisa. Great, thank you, Joey, and thank you all. I'm excited to be part of this panel. I'm going to um, also pick up on some of the themes of not only archaeology, but public outreach and interpretation. And I'm loving seeing this um, emphasis on food because that is an important part of my research as well. Let me pull my slides up. So as Joey mentioned, I work uh, in the southeastern or the southwestern United States and at the Hamalavi State Park. Um, Hamalvi is a Hopi word. Ovi means place and Hamal means small hill or small mound. Um, unlike most archaeologists that work in the Americas, this was a place where archaeologists always recognized um, ancestral Hopi sites. Um, the the um, archaeology of this area was introduced to uh, the archaeological world by Jesse Walter Fuchs in the late 1800s. He was um, up at the Hopi Mesas, so just a little, here's the state park where I work, and here's the Hopi Reservation, which is then surrounded by the Navajo Reservation. Um, and when Fuchs, he was up uh, at the Hopi Villages um, talking to people about their migration stories. He was actually doing some excavation up there and several of the clans said, oh, we come from Homolabi. And he said, oh, where's that? And they said, oh, down by the little Colorado River. Um, and so he went down, started some excavations. Um, there was a little bit more uh, sort of professional, more museum collecting uh, work that was done in the area in the late 1800s. And then the whole area was basically like people checked it off their list and said, okay, we know about that area and moved on to other parts of the Southwest. And as you all know, this is really when archeology span is getting going as a profession in this country. But what happened is many local people were very interested in the sites. They were interested with this Easterner coming and you know boxing up so many objects and then shipping them back to museums in the East. And so what happened is locals started going out and finding beautiful pottery at the sites. One of the sites within the state park is locally known as Pottery Hill. 
Um, and over the years, it wasn't just going to have a picnic and collecting a few potsherds, people started excavating. And by the 1960s, there were actually people bringing in heavy equipment to some of the sites because um, the art market for antiquities had exploded at that time. And so this got worse and worse and the local people in the town of Winslow, which is right near where the state park is located, um, got worried, as did Hopi tribal members and uh, archaeologists were brought in by the then governor of Arizona, um, Bruce Babbitt. And they uh, talked and worked out what they their recommendations were and they recommended that the um, area should be turned into a state park. Um, and that happened in the mid 1980s. Um, and the other amazing thing is the legislature in Arizona, I don't think this would happen today, they also provided funding for archaeological research. But let me show you an example of one of the largest Hopi villages, which is Tamalavi II. It's got over a thousand rooms and is my slides going to forward. Hold on one second. There we go. Um, this site, you can see the rooms, but see these things that look like moon craters. Um, those are actually uh, very, very large looting pits throughout the site. So it was the first time I remember walking up on this site, there were human bones strewn all over the place. It was a mess. Um, and the, the research project that I was part of directed by Chuck Adams through the Arizona State Museum um, started working on these very large Hopi villages. Eventually what happened is the state park was formed. There was a, a visitor center um, that was planned. And by that time I was working on my dissertation research on earlier sites within the Hamalavi area and the visitor center and the pit house site that I was working on uh, were in the same place. <laughs> so um, that got me thinking about the importance of interpretation, especially when you work on a state park. Um, and the other thing that was interesting when I was uh, uh, doing my graduate work, um, the director of the project, Chuck Adams, he had worked uh, on the Hopi Mesas doing archaeology and historic preservation. And so Hopi elders used to regularly come down. Um, they would be part of the closing ceremonies at the, the sites. Um, and so it was, I, I feel so lucky to have spent most of my graduate career in the 1980s on a project with um, clearly recognized connections to um, ancestral uh, groups and their descendants and um, also recognizing the knowledge that archeologists were creating, but also the, the wisdom and knowledge that um, Hopi people were bringing um, to this, this project. Um, so what was it was interesting for me is that um, that the relationship actually started to change in the late 1980s um, as Hopi the Hopi tribe developed a cultural preservation office so there was a set place to to um, uh, for researchers to go to interact with um, um, the Hopi tribe and also setting some agendas. Uh, for what they were interested in, and then also NAGPRA passed. So there were, it's, the relationship started to be less um, like who you know, who Chuck Adams knew, and who came to visit, but more formalized. And there were a lot of complicated reasons for, for that. But what happened um, in the early 2000s is the tribe said, we want to develop a more formal relationship with the Hamalavi State Park um, in terms of interpretation and management with the state park. And at that time, I had been developing um, um, an undergraduate research project um, and had gotten funding through NSF to bring undergraduates out. And part of that project was also, I had, it was sort of like two parallel things happening. I had planned to include interpretation in the student research experience and knew that I wanted to include um, Hopi voice and perspectives and work collaboratively um, with um, Hopi community members on this interpretation. And much to my good luck, and this is some of the message, some of what Jeff was picking up on too, is that sometimes you really just have to run with the serendipity that happens on collaborative projects. 
And I was lucky enough to meet um, Susan Sekakwaptua, who is, this is me and this is Susan, and we are on the back porch of the Hamalavi um, uh, State Visitor Center um, with the students from the project. And um, I had met Susan and asked her to be a faculty member on my project, which I called Hurop, the um, Hamalavi Undergraduate Research Opportunities Project. And she was then hired very shortly after that to be the Hopi Tribal Liaison uh, to Arizona State Park. So she could wear two hats. It just helped integrate the projects really nicely. One of the things that had always happened at Hamalavi is that there had been an open house and mostly it had been archeology span tours. And when Susan came on, she said, you know, we have done some things to present Hopi culture, but we need to formalize this a little bit more. And she said, you know, instead of calling this archeology span day at Hamalavi, let's change the name to represent all the people that are working together at this place. And so, the open house now is called Savoyuki Day. Savoyuki means a joint effort. And you can also see other Hopi words have been added where everybody comes together. Now, when we were planning together this open house, I was in the field. And so of course I would give tours. Here I am giving a tour. And I want you to notice that there are two uh, young Hopi girls there who have just been part of a race that was also part of the the annual open house and then would come out on the tours. And my students would also be involved in sharing uh, out what, you know, what, what can you learn from little broken pieces of pottery? And she's actually talking to the Navajo County commissioner who came to that open house. So state park, lots of things going on at them. And it's easy to do this when we're in the field. It was easy for me to do kind of show and tell, but one of the things that has been most important with this project is thinking about, for me, how I could maintain my relationships with the project. And uh, one of the things that just happened as I was talking to community members, one of them said, oh, you know, we've done a corn roast at this open house. Um, which is part of sort of traditional Hopi culture to share out corn and food and things like that. He said, you know, but the park just does it in this pit and they use a lot of wood. So why don't we build actually a traditional Hopi corn roasting pit? And so uh, that's what I started to do with the students. Um, in 2008, I said, great, I've got the student labor, uh, please bring in an elder to help with this. And this is um, Justin Satala. Um, who is showing two of students from my, uh, my project. And then there was an intern to learn about management at Hamalavi, who was Hopi. Um, he was also helping, so that was 2008. And um, Justin, uh, his daughter, Gwyn, right here, is one of the park rangers. And unfortunately, Justin has passed on, but Gwyn now uh, uh, organizes this roast every year. This was the last time we did it in 2019 because 2020 was canceled because of COVID. And she now has her grandson and her son. So this roasting pit now represents four generations of the Satala family uh, learning how to roast corn. And I regularly get to go. And this is... Um, one of the things that's helped me think beyond the archeology span as, as Jeff was alluding to. All right, so I'll stop sharing my screen and look forward to some questions. Great, um, thanks for those presentations. Um, so the next portion of our session will be the round table discussion. Um, facilitating today's discussion um, is Nadira Hill, a doctoral candidate in the Interdisciplinary Program in Classical Art and Archeology, span um, IPCA. Uh, she has conducted extensive fieldwork in Greece, and her dissertation uh, examines drinking and dining practices in northern Greece, um, right on theme, um, during the 4th and 5th centuries BCE. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Nadira. There are some technical things we're figuring out right now, so that you might see shifting of screens, um, but we should have things figured out in just a second. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um... So thank you, um, Joey and uh, Hannah, for um, the for your introduction, um, and thank you to all of the um, our, all of our panelists um, for being here with us today. 
Um, like our panelists have mentioned, um, have also mentioned, I'm excited to be here, um, uh, not just to facilitate the discussion of um, community archaeology, but also to learn about, to learn more about it, um, since I, in my own research, have not um, done um, really any um, of this, so I'm, I'm interested um, to learn more. Um, so as I think Joey and Hannah mentioned before, um, we have prepared a few questions um, for our panelist discussion, which will happen now. Um, and you may um, submit the Q and A um, questions in the Q and A for later. Um, that will be addressed later. Um, so our first question is one um, that has already kind of been briefly touched upon um, by the panelists in their presentations. Um, but I think uh, this is an opportunity for a little more um, uh, in-depth discussion and elaboration on some of the points that they raised. Um, so our first question um, is, how do you present yourself as an academic archaeologist to the communities you work with? Um, and how do you balance the interests of the community um, or communities you work with and the necessities or limitations of academia? Um, and any of our panelists um, can feel free to, um, to jump in or, or you can raise your hand and I can call on you. Well, I'll, I'll jump in and just, and just say that <clears throat> uh, I, I'm sure that all of the panelists would agree that this kind of work is, is full of opportunities to make mistakes. It's, it can, it, it, you know, we're presenting this in a, in a very kind of uh, rosy way, um, but in fact, there are lots and lots of opportunities to make mistakes. And I, and, and I, I think that this, um, this question of how we present ourselves is, is you know, there's, there's an opportunity there to really, you know, make a, make a mess of things. And my own reaction to that, to that question was, um, the, the question is more, how, how do they, how do they characterize me, you know, when I show up as a foreigner? Um, and, and in, in my written response to this question, I, I said that they, they call me a Hawaja, which is the, the general Sudanese term for a, a white person you know, a foreigner, white person. And, and, you know, there's really, there's nothing I can say or do that's gonna get me out of that category. Uh, so fortunately, it's not a, it's not, you know, an inherently negative one for them, um, but it's one that very much acknowledges the, um, you know, the, the element of inequality that's fundamental to our relationship. And it is a big challenge to, you know, to overcoming, to work toward, uh, uh, a, you know, a, a collaborative relationship. You have to figure out, you know, for me anyway, figuring out how to work around those inequalities and, and, and recast them in a way that, um, uh, that I think as Anna was saying, uh, recognizes the contributions on all sides um, uh, is, is important. And, and I think that that, that first moment of, how, of presenting yourself is a, is a big part of establishing that collaborative um, um, perspective. I would, I would definitely echo that, Jeff. Um, I think this is an extremely important question for all of us to consider how, how not only we present ourselves, but how we present archeology span as something that can be meaningful and useful and put to action in different spheres um, as, as needed. And um, you know, to pose a comparison to your perspective of, of being a foreigner going to a remote place to do their work when, I step outside of my office in Detroit, I might be going to do my work, you know, just a couple blocks away. Um, but in many ways, I'm still a foreigner. You know, I think archaeologists are always outsiders when they engage in a particular community context, um, whether it's locally based work or not. And part of that is because um, archaeology and archaeology is potential um, and its contributions, I, I think uh, this might be controversial, are not really well understood by the general public, whoever that might be. Um, even within the discipline of anthropology, there's sometimes some assumptions uh, that, that people carry about what archeologists do. So um, uh, inter presenting myself um, as someone who advocates for archeology span and its potential is really important to me and really, working to make archeology span relevant to the communities who uh, I'm working with and who my work serves. And so that requires taking the time 
at the beginning of a project, before the project's begun to really um, and deliberately identify shared interests and priorities and to chart the course of a collaboration with um, particular community stakeholders, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I just want to echo what's what's already been said in those lovely ways uh, and also build on that and say that um, when I am um, doing community engaged work, I also think about all the many different hats that I wear uh, when I go into a project. I'm an archaeologist, I'm a woman, I'm an outsider, I'm a mother, and most of all, I'm a teacher. Um, and that has been for me that that educational platform has been a lovely way to say let's let's all see what we can learn together. And yes, I have an archaeological perspective, but um, you know the lovely thing about working on ancestral Hopi sites and in that area is Hopi's very clear about yeah you, know, you know we we have knowledge of our past and they've worked with anthropologists for so long that they are also like we know where you're coming from and and so that creates a nice way for all of us to acknowledge for me to acknowledge the intellectual history of anthropologists working with Hopi people but um saying yeah you you know what anthropologists and archaeologists have done before let's let's talk about how to do this differently or let's talk about how to tell the story differently um but the the having students uh, be part of a collaborative project has been, especially that involves interpretation, has been um, uh, really rich because uh, Hopi people are amazing teachers and uh, just having, creating that space for that teaching to happen um, just helps keep the collaborative discussions moving along. Yeah, and I'll just add, I, I love what Lisa said about like, this being a learning process for everyone. I mean, approaching archaeology as that. Um, I certainly, like everyone else, present myself as an outsider, know that I am. Um, but I think being a graduate student is hard, but one of the benefits is that um, I feel that the power imbalance is, is mitigated somewhat because my job is to learn about their history, but just learn overall um, and learn with them and learn from them, right? So as a student, I'm coming into the project saying, you know, you have things to teach me as a community. And if you're willing to, I want to learn those things. Um, and I think that has been a huge benefit and maybe an advantage of kind of starting this as a graduate student, starting with this approach as a graduate student um, and starting it early. Everything's harder when you start as an old person. <laughs> I wanted to just, just add, I, at least I liked your list of, of, of identities and, and two of them that are really important for me um, and, and that probably, probably factor to differing degrees in all of your situations is um, being wealthy. I don't mean personally wealthy, but like as an American working in Sudan, you just if you if you don't take that into account, you're ignoring a major you know part of the, the situation, and also also education, you know, um, and and so, um, I mean, it, like a lot of these things, it seems obvious in retrospect, but I had to work to get to the point of recognizing that actually there was a lot of knowledge that I didn't have that my local uh, colleagues were providing. And it, if, you don't, if you don't look for it, it can be invisible, but all kinds of local knowledge about, you know, that, that's very essential to archeological interpretation. Like how do you grow crops in this environment? You know, there's that, that whole level of thing, um, you know, all kinds of local logistical things, all kinds of uh, how you navigate uh, local social interactions and, and so on. All of those are completely essential to really any archaeological enterprise. And and uh, um, but anyway, that's just one of the one of the uh, breakthroughs that I personally had. Yeah, I think and that's it. And should be ashamed and should be ashamed to admit. I guess. <laughs> 
I, I think that's a really great point, Jeff. And it's actually one of the things that as I think about a collaborative project, I think about what assets I can bring to the project and then what assets the community brings. And a lot of the assets are financial resources and then other sorts of technology resources I can often bring to the the project too. Um, but, but really thinking about how those are pieces of a bigger puzzle and how they all fit together have also been a really important thing for me to think of in terms of my own identity um, going into a project. Yeah, um, yeah, I think all of these points are actually um, really interesting. And I think um, in particular, I, I'm very interested in how, um, you know, the conversation has not just been about um, how you position yourself as an academic, but also um, how, uh, you know, you, you facilitate conversations and, and um, incorporate the, the knowledge of the communities you work with. Um, and also thinking about archaeology itself, um, kind of as, um, you know what is what does it mean to do archaeology in these communities? What does it mean to the to the communities themselves? Like, does it do they know anything about um, uh, the benefits of it? So I think um, that all of these pieces um, uh, are, are interesting um, points to to bring up and to consider um, here. Um, so I guess our next question um, uh, is is about um, some of the challenges or or if there are some positives that you'd like to highlight instead um, or in addition. Um, but um, what are the challenges um, of working in your cultural, political, and geographic contexts? Um, and you know, these these can be kind of broadly construed. So um, if anyone wants to jump in. I'll jump in. I think mine's pretty easy. Um, I work on a state park and actually the biggest challenge has been the bureaucracy of the Arizona state parks and uh, parks in general are focused on management um, instead of the perspective of stewardship. And so, and then that sort of shared control working with a very hierarchical organization where like all the interpretive stuff was centralized, that, that's been the biggest challenge. And it, not only a challenge for me as an archeologist, but also then a challenge for the, the Hopi tribal members to sort of figure out who's gonna take charge of what. And then, like I said, it's, it's management and tourism instead of this collaborative stewardship, um, so. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to share two challenges. Um, bureaucracy, definitely a challenge. I can I can um, empathize with that. Um, but one of the challenges, and this has already been mentioned, and it's something that um, archaeologist uh, Siobhan Hart wrote about recently, if you're interested in reading more, but uh, is that all of the, the work we do, the collaborative work, comes with discomfort. It's very hard work, and it's very unevenly paced work. Sometimes things happen really quickly or sometimes it takes years to produce the outcome that, that you're, you have in mind um, with your community partners. It's, it's hard work and it should be hard work. Um, um, but one of the distinct challenges that I face, especially in Detroit, um, is due to the fact that I'm practicing urban archaeology. It cannot not be public. And unless you're you're working in a in you know behind the the cordoned off area of a construction site or something, even then, um, word of mouth, social media, um, that's both a challenge. The publicness is both a challenge and an opportunity, um, an opportunity to engage at many different levels. You know, when the the evening news is looking for a story because it's a, a slow news day or we found something cool, you know, you have trucks pulling up and interviewing you on the spot. So you reach really wide audiences, but um, some of the challenges that come with that um, are that sometimes people um, expect certain things for you, from you that don't necessarily intersect with your archeological priorities. So going to petition city councils or speaking up on behalf of of certain political issues or taking sides with politicians. So you really have to kind of tread lightly between um, your professional practice and your public persona. Uh, and the second challenge I wanted to make um, mention of 
uh, that I face anyway, and have faced both in Montserrat and in Detroit is the tremendous lack of, of training and diversity and representation in our field when it comes to it in the Caribbean, having trained professional archeologists in on the islands and local governments and in Detroit in having diversity, both in terms of people, but also in terms of um, thought and traditions of practice in the cultural resource management industry as a whole. So I'm talking about academic archeology, span the CRM industry, but um, especially historic preservation, which is like 99.9% .9 white. Um, it's very, very difficult to put archeology span to work, to institute changes or to promote the archeology span in ways that intersect with social justice issues or dark heritage or heritage preservation of anything but the history of, of white men in um, Detroit when we don't have diversity and representation in the field. That's a huge obstacle. And as a result, um, uh, we're just not seeing urban archeology span um, reach the level of, of richness that it could be. I mean, in, it's conspicuously absent from the many different wonderful case study books that have come out about engaging archaeological practice in the past few years. So it's, it's a messy endeavor, but there's a whole lot of potential here that is still untapped. I could just mention um, that not everyone, one, one real challenge is not everyone wants to be collaborated with, um, you know, and, and so there's, there, there are different dimensions of resistance that that you can encounter. Um, I, I, you know, for me, um, one of my university based ar archaeological colleagues in Sudan um, was also working at our site and it turned out that he was much more invested in maintaining um, local status hierarchies and hierarchies of knowledge production and and than he was in kind of democratizing the process. Um, and, and this was just, it has turned out to be an unresolvable uh, conflict. Um, I mean, interesting for me to see that and I, can, I guess I can kind of understand why that would be for him, but um, that, that, has, that surprised me. It was almost as if here I'm trying to be anti-colonial in you know, my all of the team uh, is, is trying to work toward anti-colonial uh, practices, and yet the the one of our Sudanese colleagues is is almost more invested in maintaining that system than than any of us. Um, I I will weigh in here. Um, I think it's more for me more of a, a worry than a challenge. I think I've been pleasantly surprised by how smoothly things have gotten gone. Um, they have it always in the past, but with this project and this community. Um, but I am always kind of concerned that I am being sensitive and doing things right and kind of checking in and that balance between um, making sure everything is is the way that the community wants, but not also nagging them, right? They have other things to do. Um, so that's kind of something that I have been, been navigating. Um, Lisa and um, Krista mentioned bureaucracy, and that is definitely something uh, that has been a challenge, namely timeline. I think we've all mentioned here that it takes a long time to do these um, projects and in general, I have found that the community I work with tends to work at a different pace than academia that is expected of academia. Um, and so, so balancing that and navigating that. Um, I do think it's interesting, you know, we talked about identity uh, earlier and um, in some ways my identity comes into play with this. So they, they use the term Indian time, which I'm sure everybody has heard of. Uh, I'm Greek American, Cypriot American, and we have Greek time or Cypriot time. Um, and they tend to be similar in that, you know, in my culture, we know it takes a while to get stuff done. And it seems like we share this across cultures. Um, and so that's something we kind of joke about. Um, and it's a way for me to kind of connect with them and say, yeah, you know, what's expected of academia doesn't feel very natural for me either. I'm more kind of 
I more understand this pace. So let's, let's try to make this work on that pace. Great, yeah, I think um, all of these um, uh, comments and, and um, insights have been really um, interesting to think about um, the, the kind of different um, challenges um, that I um, uh, had mentioned in the question, but they are challenges and they're things that um, I think we should all um, consider um, as, as you know, people are, are getting um, interested in, in creating these sorts of projects um, and, you know, to anticipate um, if they are already in, um, in community archaeology projects. Um, so in the interest of time, I think we, we should move on to the next question. Um, and so this question um, uh, is uh, kind of going ties back into some of um, the things that we've talked about um, a little earlier about um, you know uh, creating relationships and um, and um, incorporating the community's um, voice. Um, but um, the question is, uh, what does it mean to create a sustainable community project in archaeology? Um, how do you prepare for continuing your work um, with a community when not in the field um, in the short term or after the completion of a project in the long term? And I think we could also um, think um, about uh, publications um, in, in um, this kind of realm of, of sustainable community projects. I can start out and say that the um, corn roasting pit, when I first uh, uh, said, let's let's do this, I got the student labor, you guys bring the, the wisdom of how to do that. I was looking at it very much technically. I had excavated bell-shaped storage pits and I wanted to understand how to do that. And then I had read the ethnographic uh, information about roasting corn. What I didn't anticipate was that that was the place that allowed me to come back to help because you got to clean out a corn roasting pit and who better to do it than an archaeologist who doesn't mind to get in the pit and get in and get dirty. And um, so I would never have anticipated that just being able to come and me having a role of how I could help and then the community all coming together around food again would keep going. And that has been a really important thing for me to just maintain relationships. Because one of my first um, uh, rules of community engagement is to just show up. And it's easy to show up when you're in the field. It's less easy to show up when the project's not there. But the, the um, interpretive things have allowed me to keep coming and keep saying, hey, how, we can, how can we do another project together? What else should we do? Um, it's, it's given a, a place to be able to do that. Um, and also a place for me to regularly acknowledge my mistakes and how I need to keep learning and how we are all working together to understand um, how to roast corn and how to do a, a, you know, roast hundreds of years of corn for the visitors that are, that are coming. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta say, just for transparency, Lisa Young has been a huge inspiration for my work and has taught me a lot about collaboration. So it's maybe not surprising that I'm going to echo what she says, but showing up was such a big part of how I was able to make this relationship to make this project happen. And I mean, Earl, my collaborator, kind of admitted to me like, yeah, you just kept showing up. And that's how we kind of knew that we could trust you. You didn't disappear. Um, and I think for me, I needed an excuse to go, come and show up. I don't think they really cared if I had a reason. They just wanted me to come every once in a while and see what they were up to and see the ways in which I could help. Um, and similar to your roasting pit, um, the museum exhibit that we built, that has been a way for me to continually show up um, in the process of building it and in the process of maintaining it and now probably um, thinking about the ways that we can build and expand and, and change it up. So having these interpretive or these education materials are kind of the tether, right, between, between me being able to get there and build off of what we've done in the past. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that for me, the um, the key to understanding sustainable community archaeology is in the work notion of sustainability and 
sustainable relationships. And this is really echoing what um, Anna and Lisa just said, but um, creating a really strong scaffold of relationships uh, that builds trust over time, I think ensures the long-term uh, stability and sustainability of projects. Um, you know, in Montserrat where there's a legacy of slavery and also catastrophic destruction by vol recent volcanic eruptions and in Detroit where there's multi-generational trauma associated with everything from urban renewal to bankruptcy and so on. Um, you know, these are traumatized places and, and people there have a lot of um, um, you know, things that everyone's still trying to cope with. And there's a great distrust of, you know, what I like to call drive by academics who kind of swoop in with their own interests and make a name for themselves based on engaging with some really enticing topics and then write about those topics in ways that the people in Detroit or Montserrat either can't access or don't understand and then they leave. Um, so that scaffolding and the relationship building is really, really essential. Um, but when a project ends or when the phase of the project ends that we as archeologists initiated, I think the way that you can measure success um, of whether your project is sustainable is by being able to relinquish your control over it and to back off and see what happens and then kind of kind of let go a little bit and relinquish control, let other people take over and insert their voices, be comfortable as narratives change and grow, but continue to be present. And you know, we can't all be present in the places that we work all the time, but virtually we can be. And, and um, that's really scary to do for the first time, to back off and to see other people presenting the work that you once um, initiated or initiated with your partners. But um, if, if you've scaffolded well, I think it's possible to create some really meaningful, sustainable work. Yeah, I'd just say, uh, I mean, there's different ways to think about this. And I, I, I guess um, for, for me, the sustainable part is in the heritage, not in the archeology span per se. It's not in the excavation. I mean, just based on what the local interests are and what local training is and, and local antiquities laws and everything like that. It's, I mean, I, I, I personally would love it if we could set up a system where the excavation could go on when I wasn't there and I could you know, come back uh, as I could, but that's not where we are. But in the heritage realm, it's, it is very possible to think about, uh, about sustainability. And a big part of that that um, is working well in our team is, is in fact, it, it doesn't all just depend on me on our side. Um, so, so we have, there, there are three other, four other people at the University of Michigan who are actively involved. I mentioned Ray Silverman in my talk, but also uh, Suzanne Davis, the Kelsey Museum, uh, and, and Shannon Ness, and Caitlin Clark and, and IPCA, who are all working on different parts of the project. And, and I mean, we're, we're able to be in touch electronically with people. So that, that creates a lot more momentum, having you know, more people involved on, on our side. Um, we're also working toward um, developing local curatorial knowledge in the community so that um, when we get this heritage center up and running, um, exhibits will be able to be rotated through. And one of the, one of the great discoveries that we made um, was that a, a young guy in the village made his own museum just full, I mean, it was just there. It was in, an, it was in a, a, a house that was not being used and he had just printed stuff off the internet and got a whole bunch of, of uh, community artifacts. This wasn't archeology, span it was more kind of local uh, culture and local history. Um, and so, so he's obviously somebody that we want to work with and kind of encourage to, to and, and that, that's definitely a step for sustainability. And uh, you know, another, another great outcome has been um, figuring out ways to get um, people in the village opportunities to get more education in the field. And that's obviously not gonna be for everybody, uh, but we've had a couple of people who we've, we've been able to launch that way in one way or another. So um, it, it's a great question. 
thank you everyone for um for your thoughts on on this question i think um especially the the idea of of you know, not being afraid to to let the um let the project um continue um while you're not there but also you know maintaining um, con um contact um is is really important um so in the interest of time um i think we should move on to our last question um and this question is um kind of more um, uh, thinking about um, our institutions that we work in, um, the University of Michigan, um, Wayne State, um, and um, thinking about how should outreach and community engagement um, be integrated into graduate education and archaeology? Um, where do you see community archaeology fitting into the future practice of the discipline in other realms, um, such as decolonizing the, the field, hiring and promotion practices, um, and undergraduate education and research? Okay, I'll go first. I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna speak for for the entire discipline exactly, but but my my own feeling, having gone through this kind of conversion process of of you know starting off as essentially a processual archaeologist and 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 becoming a somebody who does community engagement, is that this this engagement with the community and the engagement with different heritage traditions is absolutely essential to the continued vitality of archaeology. I mean, the old the old model where we where we, you know, are speaking exclusively to questions of academic interest, I, I just cannot see that as a viable future for the discipline. And when I compare my own experience doing that kind of work, which, you know, I'm still, I'm still actively involved in looking, you know, in those kinds of questions. But when I compare the experience of doing that with the experience of doing community archaeology, um, it, it's just night and day in terms of, you know, there's no question of relevance or you know who cares when you're doing community archaeology because it's you're, it's just blindingly obvious that a lot of people care, um, and and that you know that's a question sort of that's bothered me ever since I was a graduate student. Who the who cares question, and so so I I think I I think for the field it's essential that this become the way that archaeology is done, you know, and and I'm not even the the social justice parts of it I think are equally important, um, um, but sort of just on a personal level, um, it's, it's the excitement of engaging with people that this has been right. I, I guess I can answer the second part of the question, where do I see community archeology span fitting into the future practice of the discipline um, very succinctly? I, um, I co-authored an article with six or seven other archeologists from all over the country a couple years ago um, in the, for the journal of the SAA journal advances in archaeological practice and the title sums up my feelings on this question. Um, Engage the voting public or kiss your research goodbye with an exclamation point. So um, that's my short answer, but I, I, I would agree. I think community archaeology is at least in historical archaeology already. It's already a mainstay in the field. We just cannot separate it out from other research priorities. And I think it will be a mainstay across archaeology very soon and will hopefully catalyze positive uh, transformations in the um, areas that you listed in the question. Um, I don't want to like put us in a position where we're comparing Wayne State's graduate training versus U of M because everybody here represents different departments and, and their own intellectual traditions, but I will give us a shout out. Um, we do have, being in Detroit, an uh, advantage of being in a very culturally diverse environment and being part of a, uh, the city's rich heritage as a movement city on many different levels. Um, and so our department is designed, all four fields, so there's uh, 15 of us more or less with um, you know, half appointments and so on. Um, our department, all four fields, is designed on a framework of action oriented and applied anthropology. Um, and so for that reason, the, the vast majority of our graduate classes in archaeology and in other fields um, engage the theory and practice of community engagement um, to various degrees. So we're already doing that. Um, we could always do more. But um, those of you at U of M, you are allowed to enroll in our classes. So we have a collaborative sharing agreement. So if you don't feel like you're getting the, the uh, you don't have the space in your curriculum for those classes, we're happy to, to share our knowledge with you. 
Uh, Krista, I think that's really inspiring and, and how wonderful that Wayne State has made that a central core of, of uh, the, the, what they're teaching students. Um, at U of M, I'm seeing changes on, on some levels. Uh, we have now the Ginsburg Center, which really helps uh, people do collaborative relationships, mostly with groups here in, in Southeast uh, Michigan. Um, and then there's the Rackham Public Scholarship, which um, Anna has had. Um, but I think we need to do much more. There's sort of these bigger, there's these pieces, but they're not integrated together. And I have to say that the, the um, uh, U of M Museum of Anthropological Archaeology is putting together some new mission and vision statements, it, which include value statements and collaborative interpretation to benefit um, descendant communities is, is part of those value statements. And I'm excited about that and also uh, looking forward to see how that becomes part of the graduate education because both Jeff and Anna are part of this program. And then I do wanna point out that both Jeff and I are non-tenure track here at Michigan. So it needs to be something that on a university level also is honored with uh, the scholarship that uh, faculty and researchers on campus are doing. And I think uh, U of M recognizes that, but it still needs to be implemented in a more systematic way. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, um, as you could have guessed, I've kind of learned a lot of this by tri trial and error because I did not have any formalized classes on this. And I think it's really important to, to move in the direction that Wayne State is already at. Um, to really integrate this because it is at least one aspect of decolonizing the discipline and it, I think it is a big part of the future of archaeology and as somebody who has been on the job market recently I can say um, pretty certainly that this is a big part of what these jobs are asking for now almost all of them say that they want you to do some community engagement so um, any graduate students who are listening to this if you guys want to urge your programs to start teaching it um, I think it will benefit you on the job market. Um, well, if, if no one has anything else to add, um, I, I, I do want to thank our panelists um, again for the thoughtful um, and enlightening discussion. Um, and I think now we have um, time for a few questions from our audience um, from the Q&A. Um, so I um, have a question here um, uh, to the entire panel. Um, so when working in a landscape that has been historically contested, how have you managed to mediate between stakeholders representing descendant communities and identities that are historical and perhaps current antagonists? How do um, you create acceptance of the validity of conflicting narratives? Uh, I, I mean, I'm very much in that situation, in fact, because the, the I, I briefly mentioned the, the differing heritage narratives between, between modern Nubians in Sudan and kind of national narratives about, about how the ancient cultures fit into the, the history of all of Sudan. There are very definitely conflicting narratives that attach to, in, in quite heated ways to, to national politics. And um, I don't have a good answer. It's an excellent question. I don't have a good answer for it. Um, I've tried not to take sides tried to remain multivocal. I think that's a that's you know it, it's an imperfect solution, but it's a it's a step in the right direction, I think. I am uh, oh, go ahead, Lisa. Um, so with my project, um, you know, I have some federal regulations that I had to go through and I actually had to go through 
uh, Section 106 review, which means you invite in all communities that may have connection to uh, the, the work that you're doing and you let them know about it and things like that. And I was worried that that process was going to bring up um, some of the, the uh, different sort of connections to the place where I work. But one of the things that I learned is that all the, the descendant communities that were connected to the Malvi area, they just wanted to be included in the loop. And then when we got to the point where somebody had to sign off on that piece of paper, the memorandum of agreement, they were like, the Hopi tribe is the steward of this area now. And please just keep us in the loop, but that we acknowledge their stewardship now. So I was worried about the tensions, but as we worked through the process and there was transparency and communication, it it was okay. It all all worked out. Yeah, I, this this answer doesn't refer to indigenous communities um, like the others uh, do, or where this question maybe was um, inspired by, but. Um, in Detroit, I've last year we had a controversy involving the discovery of a, a 19th century log cabin that was encased within an early 20th century house. And that house was uh, one of the few intact remains in a really dilapidated, neglected neighborhood that and most of the properties were owned by the Detroit Land Bank. Um, so there's a whole controversy of blight management there, but it turns out that this was a really important neighborhood, totally neglected in the history of Detroit, um, of, of working class and uh, middle class African Americans who came up from the South during the Great Migration, and they had these really wonderful stories. And a few few descendants of those um, uh, migrants still lived in the neighborhood, and they were really connected to the discovery of the log cabin in some really interesting ways because it. Symbolize the kind of bootstrapping work ethic that is, you know, appreciated in the lore of Detroit, but there's not many tangible remains of that. Um, so it became a contested site because the land bank refused to let um, uh, preservationists purchase the site or take it off of their demolition list or work with the community. I pushed very, very hard for the the property to undergo a section 106 evaluation. It was being demolished with federal funds. So technically it should have um, under the law, but it com come to find out there was a loophole created in the, the blight management funds that al allowed them to bypass 106. So from my position, I'm also a, a member of the State Historic Preservation Review Board. I tried to operationalize that authority uh, to call attention to the issue and and we got, so did my other archaeology colleague on the board. We talked to the media, we talked to the board, we talked to government officials, and the, the, um, the result was that they told us this was an outlier, a historic outlier. So was this neighborhood, basically. So was the heritage. So was the working class Black history that went along with it. Um, and so I didn't succeed. I didn't succeed in creating acceptance of these conflicting narratives. Um, in fact, that whole incident showed um, the ways in which policies, heritage management policies continue to marginalize certain histories and certain groups of people. And so now I've got a real bee in my bonnet about this and, and I've, I've become quite a bit more vocal about it. Um, and that's involved, uh, that's turned out into designing many different uh, public engagement events through the Hamtramck Historical Museum and open days and writing about it and doing an exhibit about it. So it's had other outputs, but not the intended outcomes of acceptance that we'd hoped for. Um, did anyone else want to respond to this question or, or we can? I'll, I'll add something. I like blanked for a minute, but I'm back. Um, so I will echo what Lisa said about just including everyone. It seems to be really crucial. So I don't really consider where I work to be very contested, but I do work with two communities um, that have been divided largely due to government policies and have different federal uh, status. And so that um, could be a, a place of contention. Um, 
you know, it's not in large part because they have good working relationships, but I think also the fact that um, I try my best and they try to keep everyone in, loop, in the loop at the same time and just give them the opportunity to, to raise concerns, right? So that we can come up with a mutual kind of solution. Um, in terms of the question asked a little bit about historical or current kind of identities, um, my response to that would be in my work is, is finding shared interests so I work in Willapa Bay. Um, the number one industry there is uh, aquaculture. And so everyone who lives there is very bay focused and marine resource focused. And so there is kind of a shared love for the natural landscape and for these resources. And that happens to be what I'm talking about. So then that's kind of a, a bridge, right? Um, to bring everybody together um, kind of topically. Great, thank you um, everyone for your, um, your responses. Um, we have, I think, time for one more question. Um, and I apologize um, if it is a longer question. Um, I think you can see it in the, the Q&A um, if you need a reference, but um, I'll try to be <laughs> clear in reading it. Um, Anna men uh, mentioned that she actively tried to move away from taking on the role of the archeologist as a savior, a source of knowledge, et cetera. I'm interested in hearing from the panelists, how do you establish relationships with communities or engage with the communities when archeology span is almost never a priority for them? In other words, the communities that we work with often have other pressing needs. Um, how can we engage and why should we engage when we consider these other pressing needs? And how can we do this without playing that role of a savior um, or the ultimate source of knowledge? I can I can start answering that if you want, because it's kind of kind of directed to, towards me. So, I mean, my recommendation doesn't probably work in all scenarios, but um, what what we did was really try to find the connection between that pressing need and how archaeology might be able to help in some way, right? And it might not be very obvious to me as the archaeologist. Um, to really identify these needs. And it might not be very obvious for the community to understand how archeology span can be linked, but that is why we collaborate. Um, so, you know, our approach has been, what, what is the issue that the community is dealing with that they would like to tackle and how, how can we use archeology? span How can we use culture, right? Heritage, whatever it is connected to archeology span to help with that. Um, and that's how in my project we got from um, these dietary health issues, these um, issues of um, food insecurity, of diabetes, and obesity, things that you would not relate to archeology span at all, but we were able to connect to archeology span by um, using the route of traditional food ways. So yeah, in, in short, kind of doing your best to connect to those pressing needs and seeing how you might be able to help address them. Yeah, and for me that again the tribe had identified that they wanted to improve interpretive things at the state park they view that state park as a place where visitors can learn to be respectful guests than when they go up to the Hopi mesas and so. Um, like I said, it was serendipity that I was also thinking of interpretive things as part of my uh, project and so. The archaeology was the platform, but we, in all honesty, we didn't end up talking about the archaeology that much. And interestingly, when the um, interns from the Hopi tribe came down, um, they were uh, there to learn about management. And I regularly invited them in to uh, come, uh, you know, if they wanted to spend a day at the site and things like that. And um, although they wanted to regularly interact with my students because they were the same age um, and we often shared housing together and things like that, the archaeology wasn't what they were interested in. It was they wanted to go on the field trips when we were going to the national parks and, and be there and be talking about interpretation and understanding the the management decisions. So again, like Anna was saying, it's sort of figuring out 
some of what communities want. And sometimes you can find overlap with the archaeology, or sometimes the archaeology just provides that platform for having the discussions about heritage issues and interpretation and management. Yeah, I, I think this question has a lot of lot of legs. Um, you know, how, how do you approach relationships with the community or, or, or communities in a place like Detroit where a lot of people are concerned about access to clean water or quality education or much more pressing needs? I don't think there's, or in Montserrat where they're concerned about, you know, recovering from a volcanic crisis. I don't think there's anybody who would make an argument that archeology span deserves primacy of place over, over needs like that. Um, and I, I don't think that in these settings, um, archeologists are, are, who are doing community-based projects are claiming that they're there to be the savior or salvage archeology. span They're not first responders. But there is a sort of second responder nature to the work we're doing in terms of caretaking and stewardship and advocacy. We're playing the long, long game. Um, and in my experience, it's not so much that archaeology was never a priority for communities. It was maybe that the communities didn't realize that archaeology could connect with their priorities. And in both Detroit and in Montserrat, um, in my experience, people just want to be heard. They want their stories to be remembered. They want the places that uh, are, are significant in their memories to um, either be preserved or stories about them carried on into the next generation. Um, so there's more of an emphasis on caretaking and education than archeological remains necessarily, but we can help with that from our professional expertise and training. So it really boils down to in terms of what it takes to build these relationships, um, careful listening in the first instance. And maybe sometimes archeology span isn't appropriate. I can come up with a few examples to, to support that, but most of the time there are ways to make connections between archeology span and people's interests. Yeah, I like the way you phrased that, Chris. So I, I, would just, I would just second the idea that um, when, when you start with listening, there's just you you can't take a position of 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 being the all-knowing one you know i mean that's just, it's and and there's so many ways in which you know you you find out in doing this kind of work that um that you you realize you can't be the savior you know like everybody you know the, the in, in the community where i work you know access to health care is, is an issue and you know that, that can be a long-term goal. You know, maybe if we make a heritage center that's really successful, it will underwrite some amount of you know uh, a development of a clinic or something like that. Um, but again, it, it's it's meeting the the needs of the community through archaeology. I think that's a really good good way to think about it. And if you if that's where you start, then I, I think this savior complex um, it just it will not last long. I just want to add one more thing about this theme of listening, which is so important, but I've also found that it's really important to listen to what's not said as well. And that those then reflecting on when you expected a certain excitement or a response in a way, when that doesn't happen, that those are really, really important learning points as well. And, and that's that's when Krista was talking about the hard work of this, that that sort of reflection and taking that time to say, oh, this didn't go how I expected it is also really, really important for this work. Thank you. Um, well, thank you again um, for for your um, responses to these uh, to this question, and um, thank you to the audience for submitting questions. Um, I think we'll turn it over um, back over to Joey for our um, closing statements. Yeah, I just wanted to thank um, everyone for for coming and attending the session. It was it was truly wonderful, and I, I feel personally very inspired for the rest of my graduate education here. Um, and just want to yeah thank everyone and our speakers specifically um, for participating in the excellent conversation. So um, I hope everyone has a safe um, and healthy Thanksgiving break, um, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.
Thank you. Great to see everybody. Thanks, yeah. Ma salama. <laughs>